I don't quite know what to do with myself. Things have been... <laughs> I don't really have the words. I keep waking up with cuts all over my hands. And I feel perpetually thirsty. And tired. Not that I was ever the best sleeper. My job isn't exactly for someone who wants to sleep at night, but, you know, I slept. I could sleep enough to, you know, work and work and then a bit more work when I was done with that. You know, I won an award. I was so good at working. Woman of the Year. Had to give a speech and everything to all these people. Had to act shocked like they hadn't told me the week before. I am so honoured to be here today with all of you as your Woman of the Year. <laughs> now they're going to take it away. If they haven't already. God, look at me. I'm acting as if losing my award is my biggest concern. He won't stop calling. Not just him, all of them. But you know, it's that old fashioned, where were they before? When I needed them. Well, not needed, but you know, just to have someone to check in with, mix things up, have dinner with or something. I mean, he was there, kind of. That's the funny thing about marriage, how easily you drift apart and how it doesn't really take you by surprise. It's a bit like um, a picture on a shelf in direct sunlight you know each time you pick the picture up it's fine you know maybe a bit dusty so uh, you wipe it down and you put it back and you forget all about it again and then one day you go to clean it and you realize half the image is gone faded and you can't remember if it was a wall in the background or a house or a car and you can't remember where the picture was taken or when just that it was and you think oh i wish i wish i framed that or, or laminated it or, or put it somewhere else because maybe then there'd be more of it and then you put the picture right back on that shelf and you forget about it all over again until next time, until there's nothing left, until all you can do is bin it. Not that I'm ready to bin my husband or something, <laughs> although maybe he's ready to bin me. I wouldn't blame him. Maybe I should. No, no, I shouldn't. I'm deflecting. He is not the problem here. And if I'm being honest, neither am I. You see, I work, worked at this company. We did um, a pest control, you know, identification and removal of things that aren't where they're supposed to be, except the pests were humans and we were hired by the government. We were one of many, actually. The government had gone out to tender, which basically means they had a job and made a bunch of companies put forward their best offer. They hired a few of us and said, whoever had the best numbers within two years would win the whole contract. By numbers, they meant the number of successful deportation cases we could directly link ourselves to. I didn't actually start off there. My background was in sociology, with a bit of behavioural science thrown in. I was meant to be an academic, then I realised I hated studying. So after dropping out of my PhD, I bounced around a few places. Freelance for a bit, which was a nightmare, but I did it. Stuck it out for two years because as crap as it was, billable hours were 
billable hours and that meant the option of maximizing every second that I could of every day and that's really convenient when well when when you hate your life hate yourself kind of hate your husband because he's in your life hate your clothes even though they're fine hate your hair while refusing to do anything about it and it's satisfying too it makes you feel like you're doing something real with your life that you're not a failure not wasting your time your potential it's my biggest fear if i'm honest bigger than death or being left alone i'm scared of waking up one day old and realizing that i've wasted everything it's addictive that feeling of making something of yourself as a kid my parents would always say it's not about trying your best it's about getting results and as an adult i, I dole that advice out in the same way <laughs> it's never led me wrong or at least it's never led me to failure that's what other people are there for it's why i've always hated group projects putting your future your results in someone else's hand trusting and hoping they're on the same wavelength and so often they are not but when they are it's perfect like the stars aligning i had that not too long ago someone who just got it got what we were trying to do so after we became one of the lucky few to be in the running for the contract things became pretty tense at work you see, there'd been a massive influx of people coming into the country, you know, for the usual reasons, better life, escaping war, and the media had a field day with it. The front pages were plastered, social media was drowning in it. Then the typical debate started. Politicians kept having to dodge questions, you know, what are they doing? How much is this going to cost us? Are our citizens safe? And to be honest, the whole thing was pretty tedious. You know, everyone was getting angry and, and acting surprised as though this were the first time it happened in the country. Still, the government got mad, which meant they got mad at us. Why? Because more people meant more cases. And too many of those cases kept being favourable to those applying, which meant more government costs, which meant more media attention. And the cycle continues. Well, rather than our boss taking the flack for it, somehow it got delegated to one of us. And that meant someone was going to get fired. And for some reason, my name started popping up. And it would have been less of a big deal if it wasn't for the fact that six months before that, I was basically promised a promotion in the next budget cycle. And that sounds bad, I know. But I'm not one of those people that feels entitled to things just because of length of service, you know, whatever. I had earned that promotion. I put in the hours, I put in the effort. And what did I get? I got to watch all these mediocre people rising up off the back of my hard work, my ideas and my success. As embarrassing as it is, I am one of those people who lets work take over their life. <laughs> I think about it in the shower, while making dinner, when my husband tells me about his day. <laughs> I read stuff for the sole purpose of doing my job better. I was in hospital freaking. Uh, I was in hospital uh, still doing emails, taking calls, making myself available. Even went to work still wearing um, one of those diapers, you know, for the bleeding. So to hear my name being bandied around like that for something that wasn't my fault, for something that had been an issue for years, yeah, it was a kick in the teeth. It was like pepper in my eyes. I was going to be the scapegoat, the sacrificial lamb. I couldn't have that. So I did the only thing I could do. I came up with a solution. A solution that was mine and mine alone no sharing of credit no discussing with anyone no anything I suggested a pilot you see 
The shortlisted companies had each been assigned different regions and areas of the country. Of our areas, I suggested we choose the community with the highest activity. It'd give us the best idea about whether the pilot would work, and if it did, it meant we had a proven model we could roll out like that. It'd be oven ready, one might say. This particular community had been dragged in the news quite a lot because it was in the top three hot zones for the influx. This was mostly because it had a port and a rehabilitation centre for displaced people. Somehow the centre had managed to secure international agreement to allow it to take in injured or displaced people, care for them and support them in building new lives. Because of all their time in the media, they quickly got celebrity attention and the donations rolled in. As you can imagine, this only added to the anger. Why are they getting all this help and I've got none? I'm a taxpayer. I work 40 hours a week. I deserve better. <laughs> they weren't wrong. They were just knocking on the wrong door. Not that I care. I've always believed that a society is only a good one if it works to the advantage of its most vulnerable. Thanks to groups like the centre, the inequalities that persist in society can begin to be mitigated. I even donated a few times. And if a few hurting and misguided individuals choose to fight the centre over crumbs, then who was I to say stop? Anyway, once a community was selected, the next few steps were simple. Increase surveillance, gather evidence, identify the offenders, remove them. I thought about adding new cameras, but I realised it was pointless. I mean, we're already quite a heavily surveilled country and we had access to the existing footage. And cameras are quite inconclusive anyway, given that they're fixed. I mean, all it takes is for you to step out of view and suddenly you've got new evidence. What we needed was a way to enter the community, you know, see the people acting normally and catch them in the act. You're probably a bit horrified, right? If I work somewhere a bit more personable, I probably would be too. But my colleagues loved it. This did create a new challenge, hiring people. We couldn't exactly recruit through the normal means. The people we chose needed to be vetted. We had to make sure we could trust them that they wouldn't jeopardise the project for themselves or for us. In other words, we needed people who needed us. Or at least the money we plan to offer. <laughs> There's another branch of my company. It's where we do all of our corporate social responsibility work. You know, community building, sustainability, that kind of stuff. One of the company's key aims is community regeneration. Outside of the capital, opportunities can be pretty hard to come by. There are less jobs and soaring youth unemployment. High streets are dying. Small business owners are losing out with each passing day while corporate conglomerates get fatter and fatter. None of the trickle-down stuff they promised. So there we were. Two groups with an issue. They were a community losing out and I had cameras that couldn't go anywhere, couldn't give me anything useful. So then I figured, what if the cameras could move and talk? And what if they look like your teacher, your best friend, the shopkeeper? And just like that, we had an unlimited pool of individuals just waiting for the right opportunity, a chance to make something of themselves, change their lives, change their family's life. And that's how I met her. A bit more intentional. Jacket and... I was hiding along with my friends. Um, I really needed a job and there was barely any. And no one wanted to hire a 15 year old. Those that did, wanted to pay me peanuts. Literally. Someone said they'd pay me food. So I was really lucky to get this. I did it for three years, from year 10 to the summer just before uni. I loved how flexible it was. 
you know, it meant that I could revise and still see my friends. In fact, I got to see my friends even more because of all the research we had to do. That's what they called it, what they called us. Research Associates for a Community Equilibrium Project. They told us it was a pilot to better understand community identity and what it means to integrate. We had to do training. There was all the usual stuff like effective communication and what it means to be a leader. The interesting part was the sociology of building a society. You know, who belongs and who doesn't and who gets to decide and what that means for everyone on a psychological level. It's not something I ever really thought about before. You know, I never had to. And not that I was oblivious or anything. It's just that I was busy enough as it was just trying to get by. You know, only people with time on their hands can spend it thinking about things like that. And by that, I mean people with money, people with power, you know, those with less responsibilities and less burdens. People whose parents didn't need them to get a job at 15. You know, people who don't know what it's like to go to bed hungry or have to measure out how much milk is needed to last a week. But I wanted to be someone like that. You know, someone with time. Someone who could sit around and talk about what it means to be part of a society, rather than actually having to be a part of it. That's why I ended up studying sociology. I wanted to be more than just a cog. If I could understand why society was the way it was, then I could change it. I could make it better, make it work. And that's what we were doing here. Conducting real actual research to make our society better. The best part was we'd been chosen, you know, for our realness, our connection to the community, our relationships. They told us we represented everything that was good about this place and they wanted to protect that then replicate it around the whole country. Someone jokingly called us Eden, but we were smarter than that. We would actually kill the snake before we let anything ruin this. The only cost was silence. I mean, I didn't mind. Unlike my friends, it actually made me feel kind of special. Like I was undercover in some sort of spy movie, just without the cool outfits. Plus it was really good pay. I mean, we didn't have a salary or anything, it was on commission. Kind of like sales. So you make a sale, you get paid, you make no sales, no pay. So the bigger the sale, the bigger the pay. And yeah, sometimes our research was a bit speculative. You know, we'd just go out and see what you could find to fit the weekly brief. And other times, you know, there were specific things we had been asked to look for. Specific groups we had been assigned to. It was pretty easy once you got the hang of things, you know, I, I can't imagine anyone had nothing. You'd have to be a special breed of incompetent, like if Mr Bean and Joe from Friends had a baby. Kelly said that once. We'd been in the cafe and we'd seen this man accidentally pour salt into his tea. <laughs> He'd complain about it and do it three more times before finally getting a fresh cup. Kelly couldn't believe what she was seeing. She had this whole thing of wiping her glasses and rubbing her eyes just to see if it was real. It's funny how life works out. I could only afford uni because of this job and I only got this job because of Kelly. And here I am, an undergraduate and Kelly's dead and we still don't know how or rather why and who did it. I saw those pictures in the papers. They shouldn't have been allowed to post them. I mean, Kelly, she could be a lot, but no one deserved that. And I bet if she'd been under 18, they wouldn't have been allowed to post them because you can't post pictures of minors like that. But unfortunately for Kelly, she turned 18 two weeks before, so I guess she was fair game. I didn't know Kelly very well before we started working together. I mean, we had a few classes and we walked the same way to school. To be honest, she seemed kind of annoying. You know, those overly serious and quiet types. But we shared a best friend and she recommended us 
for the job. Apparently, you get a bonus if you recommend someone good, and I guess I was good. My mum, she says I have the personality of smooth whiskey, and by that she means people find me really easy to get along with. And if they talk to me long enough, it makes them want to open up. It's always been that way with me. People like to share stuff, you know, talk about their lives and their pain, telling me about their problems like I don't have any of my own. We made a great team. The three of us, we had a whole system. You know, we'd get the brief, the bile up the research, and then report back. But at least now I was being paid for it. At first, Kenny wanted us to share everything so we'd split the pay. But that really wasn't fair. I mean, I was doing all this work, going out there, getting to know people, but they get the same as me. And that's when I knew something had to change. And so I called her. You can say that's when everything fell apart.